Welcome everyone to the May 2020 edition of AZ Bio Peers. I'm Joan Kerber Walker, and AZ Bio Peers provides professional education, engagement, and resource sharing where members of Arizona's bioscience community come together with their tips, tricks, and education on all of the key things that are involved in building a thriving bioscience business. Today, we are going to be hosted by Dr. Natalie Mitchell. Um, Natalie has been leading the AZ Bio Peers program and is also um, responsible for our mentoring program as well as our education programs. And with that, um, she is going to lead us on our panel. Um, kick it off, Natalie. Thank you, Joan. Welcome, everybody. Um, as Joan introduced me, I'm Natalie Mitchell. Uh, I am the Entrepreneurial Program and Grants Manager here at AZ Bio. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone, for joining our session. Uh, listening to uh, people who have been successful in uh, attaining SBIRs and STTRs from various agencies, uh, including the NH uh, NIH, NSF, and DOD. Uh, so we're very glad to have you all here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I just wanted to go around and uh, have everybody introduce themselves, their company that they work for, as well as uh, the number of SBIRs or STTRs you've received, of what phase, and what agency. Um, so, Sonia, since you're uh, there at the top, can you um, introduce yourself and, and your grants? Sure. Uh, thank you, Natalie, and thanks for inviting me to this panel. It's nice to see a lot of my friends here today. Uh, so I'm Sonia Vognot, and I have a consulting company called OpSpot, but in the past, I've also had my own companies and worked for other companies doing SBIR, STTR. Um, I have applied probably in probably one, almost every agency out there. Um, and so I have experience across the board helping others as well as winning for my own businesses. Um, today, I suppose we're going to be mostly focusing on possibly NIH and NSF and, and the military, the DOD also uh, awards um, uh, medical device or biomedical uh, um, solutions. So uh, I don't know. I, I guess if I had to count, uh, there'll be close to 50 or more uh, SBIR, STTRs that I have won either for myself or for others in combination. So I've been doing this nearly 20 years um, focused on this program, but I also uh, can support other types of grants and contracts. And my background systems engineering, so that's kind of what I leverage to when I write uh, proposals. Great, thank you so much, Sonia. Um, Evan, uh, you come from Nuvox Pharma. Can you um, introduce yourself? In your uh, hi, uh, I'm Evan Unger, and uh, I'm a professor emeritus at the University of Arizona in radiology and biomedical engineering, and I've founded four uh, different biotech companies. The first made uh, the world's number one selling ultrasound contrast agent. It's responsible for 55% of the sales of a publicly held company with a market cap of $4 billion. So that was a successful company, a successful exit acquired by DuPont. The second company went public. Uh, I have two companies I'm working on right now, uh, Nuvox and Microvascular Therapeutics. Uh, uh, so um, I don't know how many I've had, maybe, I've never applied for anybody else, but uh, probably around 30 different um, SBIR, STTR grants. Currently, uh, we have three active grants for Nuvox. We just got one from the DOD for $2 million for immuno-oncology. We have a $3 million uh, phase 2B SBIR grant funding a clinical trial, and we have a $500,000 preclinical grant supporting stroke. For the other company, um, I'm working with uh, um, Emmanuel Mouillet, uh, who is the chief scientific officer, and that company has five um, uh, grants, uh, all from NIH. Um, they're all sort of SBIR or STTR, but uh, one of them is the Catalyze program, uh, which is nice. It's around 750000 And then another is the Commercialization Readiness program, 
which is 500,000. Uh, I think two of them are phase ones, and then one is a direct to phase two for 1.7 million. So currently, I guess I have um, eight grants, but for the other company, I can't be PI on those. So um, uh, it's either Emmanuel Mouye or my son, who's the PI. He's a physician. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Evan. Um, and uh, David, uh, would you would you like to introduce yourself and companies? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Dave Tallenfeld with Botanisol Analytics. Um, we've won four SBIR SDTR contracts with the Air Force. We make uh, an autonomous testing kiosk uses a laser to tell you if you're sick or not. Great. Thank you. And Erica, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yes, I am a co-founder of a TF Health Company, which is a commercial product under the name of Breezing, the metabolic analyzer. Uh, we receive uh, about five uh, SBIRs uh, awards, including uh, two fast tracks uh, for this company. And they were really important to, uh, for you know, developing the whole product uh, and taking it to FDA uh, for clearance. It receives uh, clearance in September, 2020. And uh, recently we had uh, FDA audit and everything went very well. So these SBI are, uh, were instrumental to support all, all this effort. And uh, it, they allowed us to keep the company and dilute it at the point and mature the company in a way uh, where we are ready you know for an exit um, so th these were uh, phenomena my second experience is uh, with sequitur health uh, which i co-founded with uh, dr mary laura lynn and dr thomas uh, dr mary laura is from asu and dr thomas is from mayo uh, we have received uh, four SBIR awards uh, for that company, uh, two phase uh, one and two phase two. Currently, uh, we are under uh, two phase two with uh, very uh, distinctive aims that we formulated um, to one to NSF and the other to NIH. And, uh, you know, this is substantial um, funds uh, to develop the product and we are in the process of of developing this product so i'm a, also a asu entrepreneur professor so i'm an i am an entrepreneur by heart my my i will say my hobby is developing products and, and gives me a great satisfaction so um in terms of uh, sbirs uh, i found uh, that is a very interesting uh, process a learning process, uh, but a high rewarding process when you get uh, these funds. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to share my experience today in this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, everybody, for joining us and um, having, helping us um, uh, dis uh, discuss uh, your, uh, uh, your experiences with the SBIR and STTR programs. Um, so great, uh, thank you so much. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, ask some questions of the group. Uh, so what is the best advice you think that you can give someone about uh, thinking about submitting their first SBIR or STTR grant? Uh, Evan, I'm gonna start with you. Um, okay, uh, thank you, uh, Natalie. Um, so, um, you know, you're an entrepreneur and you want to apply for an SBIR grant. First thing is, um, uh, do you have an MD or a PhD degree or are you an MD PhD? Uh, if you're not, uh, you're going to be disadvantaged if you apply as the PI. So the, the, the first thing is to choose the PI. Now I'm an MD and I have um, a reputation within my niche, within my field, so that's helpful. But I think in all of my grants, I've uh, worked with a KOL, a key opinion leader, who I, I'm trying to develop a technology for an application. And uh, I don't think I've been successful trying to develop 
a technology for the sake of the technology. It's always been for an application. And so then um, I do have collaborations, which makes it easy, but I will actually search out someone and try to develop uh, a relationship with that person and uh, then do a proposal with um, one or more uh, key opinion leaders. And then uh, we decide what we're gonna do and uh, we will uh, draft the specific aims and then typically we'll send those specific aims to the program officer in the section that we think is gonna review the grant and we'll get the input from the program officer. And so after we've done those things and put that in place, then we'll really begin to work on uh, designing the experimental plan, the budget and so on. So those are um, my, uh, that's my advice. Erica, do you th would you like to share what you think um, so, uh, is the best advice you can give to someone thinking about an SBIR or SDTR? Okay, the, the best advice, um, I prepared a brief summary based on my experience. If I could share the, the slides here, uh, I, I, can, I can share this um, experience. Uh, my main experience is with um, NIH. So um, I'm talking from the NIH perspective. So my base advice is think about uh, the audience first. Uh, for NIH, um, what you will be um, funded for is, is mostly for the impact and the likelihood that the project uh, will be sustained, powerful, and influence uh, the commercial field or the research. But the most important is uh, focusing on the reviewers and what the reviewers will be looking at uh, in the application. This is the audience. Uh, it's not a peer that knows specifically your field and you have to put a lot of deep thoughts into your technical aspects. Think about more of a layman uh, person trying to understand what you will be doing and, and what is the impact of uh, the product that you are presenting. Uh, typically, reviewers belong to uh, a small businesses too, and they've been in the, in the same process, so they, they understand very deeply what, uh, what is involved in getting uh, one proposal out. Um, and uh, the other aspect is the, the, the program staff, the program officer will be the one also uh, making a decision in case your proposal comes to the, the, the you know, the line cut for the budget uh, is, uh, you know, it received a, a good score, but not super high that is talking by itself. So there will be maybe a process where uh, the, the program officer will come back with questions addressing uh, the reviews critiques. So you always uh, need to think about these two components of the audience uh, when you talk to them. Uh, don't be too specific, go to the big picture and address things in a simple uh, language, uh, but with deep understanding. Uh, so I think this is the, the most important advice that I could give uh, to anyone. Um, applying for this type of grants. We can talk about more details as we go through this panel. I don't want to, you know, cover uh, lots of minutes uh, right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Um, oh, uh, Dave, do you have any, um, any quick thoughts and advice that you can give the group? Sure. I'm, and, and this is going to be a constant refrain from me during this uh, meeting. Um, check out the AFWORKS grants from the Air Force. The Air Force has a, an innovation arm called AFWORKS and Air Force Ventures, and they are the least onerous SBIR, STTR proposals you will ever submit. Um, when I got my phase one, it required um, a five page narrative and, a, and 15 PowerPoint slides. And that was it. Um, phase two, you just get uh, an Air Force customer to sign a memo saying that they're interested in what you're doing. Anybody anywhere throughout the Air Force and you can get um up to a million and a half dollars with you know a 20 page narrative um most of which is not technical uh, much of which is customer focused so 
highly encourage anybody to 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 check those out and i'm available to um make introductions or, or answer questions about it you can also use them to get um investor matching funds because they will provide a one-to-one -one match to investor dollars so you can you can use the one against the other so you can you can get the 1.5 million from the air force and you can go to the investors and say and if you give me a matching funds memo uh by the time this proposal is due then the air force will match the investor dollars so you can actually get both at once that's interesting that's really great thanks dave and uh sonia i'll uh finish up with here with you yeah i mean just to add on i think uh, all the points uh, said are extremely important and, and and useful one of the things that i would recommend you know from from the other end uh you know helping um uh, the companies is uh, read instructions and know your customers uh if, if you don't know that well you're going to be in trouble right and so i find myself constantly trying to explain to people why they should do something in a certain way and it's generally because they fail to read the instructions or understand it and then um, they write proposals that are not addressing the requirements of their customers so in many cases um, you know it depends if you're doing nih or nsf or if you're responding to uh, to a solicitation uh, with the DOD, not necessarily AppWorks, but uh, because they have the open topics and you could go the route that Dave's talking about in many cases, and then you have to still find a customer and work with them. But uh, in other cases, either you have to define the customer and really understand and have validated the need. And uh, in the other case where it's the Army or the Navy telling you specifically what they need, you need to make sure that your proposal is addressing each and every one of those requirements. Otherwise, it would not be compliant. So you've got both the administrative compliance when you submit an, a proposal, which are the instructions, and then you have the compliance to the requirements and the objectives that are laid out on the solicitation. When you're responding to NIH or NSF or to some open topics, you have more flexibility, but then it becomes your responsibility to be very clear and succinct what it is you're going to be doing, why and how. Thank you, Sonia. Um, I'm just going to get to a question from the chat and to remind everybody uh, that's here today. Thank you so much for joining. And if you have any questions for the panel, please put them in the chat and I'll be happy to ask uh, the panelists your questions. Um, so here's one from uh, Juliet Gomez of the Flynn Foundation. Um, so uh, they've been hearing from entrepreneurs that the SBIR program managers are hard to get a hold of these days. Uh, voicemail boxes are full and aren't returning emails. Um, do you have any other suggestions for options available to entrepreneurs to get advice or help? Uh, I've been Sonia hearing the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been hearing the same thing, Natalie and, and Juliet, where People are just calling me saying I need to, you know, talk to the TPOC or or the technical point of contact or the topic author and they're not responding. Uh, that could be for many reasons, you know, they could just be overwhelmed or they don't understand that they've been given this assignment and that they need to respond. Right. And specifically with the DOD, there's a solicitation out. And I think the time that you can talk to these authors are uh, ends tomorrow. And so after that, you can't talk to them directly. You have to talk to them uh, through the, the online thing and everybody can see your questions. And so, you know, talking about understanding what your customer needs, if you can't talk to them, it, it becomes really um, uh, difficult to make sure that you, you're putting together a good proposal. Uh, so what I've been advising is to go to the, uh, the SBIR, SDTR program managers, uh, and those, uh, sometimes you don't know them directly, sometimes they're listed on the website, but if you explain, you know, this topic author is not responding and it's really important, that's one way of doing it. Uh, the other one is, you know, to contact other people that you know that might know this individual. Uh, so, you know, Dave's already offered, uh, he knows a lot of people at the Air Force, <laughs> and so that might be another direction, is who you know uh, can sometimes help you because uh, you know, a lot of these topic authors really do want to help, but they also have not really fully been explained the, the rules of the game. And they're overwhelmed by all the, the, 
the the input from in their mailboxes or their phone and they don't know specifically the rules of how they need to respond and uh, and i think that's one of the causes the other one COVID, did not help they've gone to work from their homes and their phone lines uh, at the office have not been transferred to their phone lines or cell phones at home. So they don't even know that they're being contacted over the phone. And that, that happened at the start of COVID and in some cases uh, it's still happening. So that, you know, go directly to the SBIR, STTR program office. They might help you. They might even find someone that, that can uh, talk to that topic or uh, talk to someone who might know these people. Uh, together collectively, uh, you've attained several dozen SBIR and SB STTR grants amongst yourselves. So um, do you think that you have like a special formula or special blend of 11 herbs and spices that, uh, you, that you have that you bring uh, to your grants uh, when you apply that you think makes your grants successful? Um, does anybody have um, something that you feel that makes your application stand out and be successful? Um, Sonia, can I start, start with you? Uh, okay, so a couple of ways. I'm a systems engineer. I'm process oriented. So I recommend to write proposals that that speak to that, right? On, you have to understand your problem and your statement and your customer's need. And from that, translate it to measurable objectives. And from that, translate to tasks that you can clearly outline in your approach. And so if you do that, I think it helps write a proposal that's easier to read and understand by the reviewers. Uh, so I'm really um, uh, anal about the systems engineering approach approach and the scientific approach, right? In terms of hypotheses and questions that you're addressing and what how you're going to be uh, going about proving them. But the other thing that I really love is to have a good standout introductory figure. And in the case of uh, NIH, uh, sometimes the specific aims does not, that one pager doesn't let you put it in there, but you could do that on the significance in the first section of your um, uh, research strategy and your plan, where the reviewer really from the get-go will understand what is your service or product and who are the stakeholders and how your innovation stands out in that ecosystem. And if you do that with a really cool, good, well-done figure, it really motivates the reviewers. They start out with a good, uh, good uh, feeling about it because they understand what you're delivering from the get-go with a good image. Uh, so that's one of my biggest recommendations. Great, thank you. Does anybody else um, want to comment um, something that they uh, feel makes their proposal stand out? Um, well, um, I've um, had the, I don't know if it's good fortune or opportunity to serve on the study sections at NIH, and um, it's a lot of work, but I was a permanent member for about six years of the NCI nanotechnologies in cancer study section, and then I've been ad hoc, oh, maybe it's 20 times, and so that, it's kind of a painful thing. It's so much work, but you really learn what reviewers are looking for, and um, yeah, that that's that's helpful, but it's a lot of work. From my experience, uh, if you are submitting uh, proposals uh, to NIH, uh, it's really tackling every single bullet point I'm showing here. The significance, the show the innovate the investigators' innovation approach environment. Uh, so. Uh, I think it's important to keep the, the key points um, where uh, the reviewers will be uh, scoring for. Uh, so each of these uh, points needs to get good score. In general, um, from my experience, uh, the approach is the, the one that I would recommend that you pay the most attention. Uh, as um, 
as it was mentioned, uh, the significance is the, the, the place where you can start with the session, a nice figure, so the reviewer, you capture the reviewer's attention. But in addition to that, I would recommend that uh, you keep the attention of the reviewer engaged in a good mood by uh, addressing all these, uh, these bullet points. So the, the things that they specifically look for is um, in the significant, what is the unmet need, right? And, uh, and the rigor of the prior research, uh, the analysis of pro and cons and, and why what you, what you are bringing is unique. Okay, in a, in a phase one, uh, there is no need uh, of commercialization plan as in phase two, but there is a need in the significance to address the commercialization potential. Uh, for the investigators, uh, the, the thing uh, that they will look into is the bio sketches supporting uh, the qualifications uh, of the personnel to do the work that you described. In, in the proposal, and it's important to give demonstration that you have you can deliver the capacity of the, the team to deliver uh, previous products in the market, patents, and uh, positions with increasing uh, responsibility. Uh, it also helps a lot to ask support letters from uh, ongoing collaborations or future uh, collaborators that are very uh, interested in uh, pursuing the effort with you. That, that helps a lot uh, to bring uh, the investigation or uh, sections uh, with high score. In terms of the innovation section, um, this is uh, really uh, focusing on what is the key component of your concept, uh, your product or your research. It could be research, not, not just product uh, or SBIR. Research you want to establish to validate your product, for example, could be an example. Um, so uh, the innovation uh, really needs to, to have all these uh, things on uh, the challenges that uh, your pro your product or research is addressing and a very clear statement uh, of why your approach to addressing that challenge is that you mentioned is, is supported by the innovation. And the approach, which is uh, what I mentioned before, uh, which is the, the trickiest ones that typically brings the overall score down, down uh, is, is where I recommend emphasizing. So you, you keep this reviewer right engaged through uh, out the proposal until the end with the approach. And what the reviewers will be looking at is that you are addressing with your procedure the, the weaknesses of the um, prior research. So most probably in the prior research, in the significance, you said some cons for existing products or methods. So here is where you have to demonstrate how you will be addressing those uh, weaknesses and, and uh, bringing the strategies. Um, and the, there is a very important point here, the potential problems and alternative strategies you always need to assume that something may fail and it's good for a, um, for a proposal to have that point of failure and demonstrate um, from the, the writer uh, perspective that you know how to address that potential problem that may come. So you have you know, an extra card under your sleeve in case something uh, gets um, you know, an unforeseen event of what you are planning. This is, this is very relevant uh, because it demonstrates how wise the, the people involved in the project um, are and, and give confidence that the work uh, can be done. So that's a, a way to keep uh, engagement. Um, and obviously, a strategy to maintain feasibility you know, must be uh, throughout the, the approach all the time, all, all the, the, the length of this section. Environment is typically something that we can address easily and is evaluated. And um, here you, you can get uh, the, you know, with, from your collaborators, 
uh, the institutional uh, support, list of equipment, other physical resources, and that will enrich the environment of the small business. Uh, many times the small business even have you know, a location, but if you have uh, a cool uh, institutional support from your collaborators, you give that uh, reinforcement to the reviewer, oh, okay, this, this can be done. So uh, yeah, this is my, my summary on, on the main five aspects uh, for an NIH proposal. Sorry if I was too long. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for preparing those slides. Um, great. Um, we often hear that uh, from newly formed founders, uh, of newly founders of newly formed companies, um, that they only want to use uh, non-dilutive funding in the form of grants. Uh, but some, this can often lead to gaps in grants between the phases, so from a phase one to a phase two. Um, how do you use uh, SBIR, SDTR funds in your overall business strategy to make sure that you have funding for your business throughout? Um, Dave, can I start with you? Sure. I mean, I think a lot of people have strong preferences about how they would like their um, startup to turn out. And, um, you know, it's always been my experience that you just try everything and take what you get. So um, when somebody says, I only ever want to take SBIR funding, I think that's a great strategy and it can work. Um, but one of the challenges is that there are certain categories of things that SBIR funding will not pay for. Um, I don't know if this has changed, but the last time I applied for like an NIH SBIR, you are not allowed, you were not at that time allowed to, to use the funding for patents. Um, I don't know if that's, maybe somebody else on the panel can speak to that, but there were a variety of things you're just not allowed to use a research grant for. And so the funding for those things has to come from somewhere. Evan, you look like maybe you're going to chime in here. Uh, well, um, if you have a phase two, you can apply uh, when NHLBI for the Catalyze program and uh, for others, uh, uh, NCI, uh, you can apply if you have a phase two for uh, the Commercialization Readiness Program. And those are unique because uh, they will pay for things like that. Uh, you can pay for but when you're doing the others, you're correct. It doesn't pay for patents, uh, legal, uh, administrative. Uh, it, you know, you can have an indirect rate and you can charge a fee. I think the fee can be up to 7%. And so you can use the indirect, the fee for whatever you want. But, um, you know, I've, I've always been doing this biomedical stuff where you typically do not ever get sales in the company maybe you get some partnerships. So you're having to sweat bullets, raise money. And then once you've got the drug in say phase three, or you've done a phase two trial, then you can sell the business. But um, so it's very tough to um, do these kind of bootstrap companies without getting a mixture of dilutive and non-dilutive financing. And I agree with you, Dave, hundred percent. You're, you're doing everything you can. You're trying to look at all the different options. And if you can leverage your grants to get to some kind of inflection point where you've de-risked the asset, then you can raise the dilutive funding uh, potentially at a better rate, but that's also gonna depend on the market. And right now, I think we're entering a very tough time for uh, technology and biomedical. I, I have a um, I have a saying, um, you know, if you if you choose your your ideal strategy and you pursue only that, it's actually not a strategy. It's a hope. Yes, so, correct. You know, <laughs> and I, I see this a lot in early stage entrepreneurship where they 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 name the thing that they want and then they start marching towards it. And, you know, you always have to have contingency plans and, and you know, whether you intend to raise money from investors or not engaging with those investors will will improve your business um you will learn things from them that they need to see um so you know we i was a tech stars portfolio company and um they say you know never miss an opportunity to pitch you know even if you don't need the money so 
Great, thanks. Um, anyone else from the panel want to uh, have anything to contribute there? Well, I, it's just, it's kind of stating the obvious, but these NIH grants, you have a phase one, then you have a phase two. And so you do your phase one. And a lot of times I end up having to ask for a no cost extension because we didn't meet our milestones. And, uh, but then you have a gap between the phase one and the phase two. And so, you know, how are you going to cover that you know, out of your own pocket or friends and family or investors? It sounds like Erica has been pretty successful uh, getting uh, fast tracks and uh, fast tracks are, are more competitive. They're a lot more work, but uh, that's a way to avoid that gap. Uh, and then I have had success a couple of times uh, getting direct to phase twos where you can get uh, you know, 2 million. And now they've increased the programs. And I think the phase 2B for uh, NCI is around 4 million. But um, I just had my first DOD grant. Um, I, I, they've all been NIH. And uh, the DOD has a, uh, a history of if, if you really perform, they'll continue to fund that program all the way in the case of a drug. Uh, to FDA approval, there are precedents for that. So um, that could be a very good opportunity. And hopefully we can execute. Erica, speaking of uh, fast I, I, I tracks. Just, I just chime into uh, what uh, they was uh, saying. So here is a, a scheme of the different programs uh, from NIH. Phase one, it could be just phase one, six to 12 months. Uh, this is a, a nominal number, but you you know you can request up to half a million if you talk to the program officer and become familiar um, with with him and the, the involved. Um, but you need to get an uh, authorization for that. Um, solely uh, phase two, and uh, it's up to two years. Uh, for full uh, R and D, and then uh, you could have, uh, if you have a previous phase one from a different entity, say uh, DOD, NSF, you can apply directly for uh, phase uh, two. This is uh, what we did uh, for our current phase two uh, NIH um, SBIR that we have, uh, and this is nice uh, because this this allows probably from one phase one you had, you can multiply and apply for, to phase two to NIH and then maybe to NSF. Or, uh, so um, that way uh, it brings a uh, double money uh, with two phase two. Um, and then the, the fast track is uh, what uh, um, Dave was mentioning uh, that we got, um, um, and it's, it's very nice to have because you, you can seamlessly continue your work. The key point to do this is uh, work um, very hard on preliminary data and demonstrate that basically you pretty much have the milestones met for a phase one in your preliminary uh, data section of the proposal. If you have that level of uh, progress done with a project, then yes, you can jump into a fast track. It's a lot of work, but not very much different from preparing a phase two, a standalone phase two that requires commercialization plan. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is, this is feasible. And in general, the phase two and fast tracks uh, have a equal uh, success rate. Uh, and uh, the success rate is higher than uh, phase ones because uh, typically uh, review panels receive more phase ones than phase two. So from let's uh, say 10 phase two or fast track receive uh, five of them, 50% uh, will get discussed. And um, since they are you know, less quantity, right? Uh, at the end, there is a more chance to get uh, fund it uh, if you did a good job in the presentation. And then the, the nice thing of NIH and some institutes, not all institutes offer this possibility, is getting uh, the phase 2B 
uh, phase two B, uh, you can uh, do it while you have your first fa uh, your phase two at any point. You could be awarded today and uh, start to write a uh, phase two B tomorrow. So it's not related uh, to the successfulness of um, phase two, but uh, you need to have an investor um, letter uh, with future commitment there. So yeah, this is just an overview of, of these programs, I guess. Someone in no, that, was, that was perfect. Thank you so much, Erica. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we... Um, what do you think takes the most um, time and effort uh, in um, a phase one or phase two grant proposal? Um, and, and how much time do you think that it approximately takes and, uh, for that section? Um, uh, so, Sonia, can I start with you? Uh, sure. I think, um, you know, we've discussed in the case of the NIH for the phase one, you don't necessarily need, well, you don't need a commercialization plan, but if you're gonna do a fast track or a direct phase two with the NIH, that commercialization strategy, if you don't really know how you're gonna get your product to market and who you're gonna do it with and all that stuff, that could take a lot of time. Um, so that that's probably where I see a lot of the, the people I work with and my team struggling because you know, you know uh, about your product and the science and you know how to do your research, but necessary, you don't necessarily as a startup or a small business know how to do business development and how to take a product to market. And especially with uh, drugs or medical devices, the process is very long, expensive, arduous, and uh, knowing how to create a, a proper commercialization plan uh, is one of the areas that will take you the most because for the most part, the, uh, the scientists and the researchers know how to implement and how to propose what they're going to do. So I think that's where they struggle the most. Um, the, that would be my, rec you know, my recommendation is to maybe get help in that section. Where would they go for help? Who can help them with, with a commercialization strategy? So uh, I had put on the chat uh, earlier, there's now most agencies, uh, except the Air Force and maybe one or two other ones, uh, offer technical and business assistance. And they will, for the phase one, give you $6,500 to help you uh, use those funds towards commercialization strategies where you can hire uh, companies or people like myself or other experts. And under a phase two, they can give you up to 50,000. And in some cases, you can even use that fund to, to do patent strategies, funding strategies, go to market strategies, market research. Um, I've even used that to create videos for your products or for your companies. It's just very, you could get very creative in defining it. Uh, so that would be one recommendation. Um, the NIH and, and I believe also the Air Force and, and other agencies have really, really robust um, uh, programs to help you also um, with the commercialization. So if you win an NIH, uh, you could also uh, apply for the i program. And the i program will help you with the customer discovery and with validating the need as well as your business strategy and model. And with 100 interviews or more, uh, you're going to find those key opinion leaders. You're going to find the subject matter experts. You're going to find the regulators and the uh, business strategies that can certainly, if you're also looking to 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 grow your company or to to get further investment or or um, know what to do next, uh, the ICOR program is the way to go. Um, and they have the commercialization readiness program. There's all these things. You just have to be aware. And you get aware by asking and you have to apply. And generally the applications are not complicated. So those are my recommendations. Oftentimes, um, first time awardees of SBIRs and STTRs um, don't quite know how to navigate the onerous federal uh, accounting requirements that go into um, uh, uh, the budgeting, uh, uh, budgeting for the grants. 
Um, do you, uh, does anyone recommend uh, the use of a contractor for SBIR accounting or do they do it, do everything in house? Okay, in my case, uh, I personally have done it in house. Uh, there is no uh, rocket science behind, you just read and follow instructions. Everything is uh, pretty straightforward, I would say. So uh, it's just time that takes, you know, so you need to balance whether you want to do it yourself or ask for help. But from my personal perspective, it's something that you can uh, accomplish uh, very easily. And uh, that gives you also the sense of the, um, you know, controlling and, and managing the resources, how to request the money to the payment management system, you know, when a report comes, um, deadlines, and it helps to plan mentally throughout the, the project, uh, having control on, on the resources and, and the money coming in and how the money goes out and you, you see, you know, the, the, the flow and the average expenditure rate. And it helps planning uh, mentally for the future. So I would recommend uh, the small businesses, you know, to take full control of that aspect. That's my personal advice. I'd like to make a, a comment. I, I think I currently have five and a half million of active grants for each of the two companies. That's like $11 million. I'm not an accountant. I hate accounting. And um, that's not my skill set. And I need someone to help me. If you're in academics and some of the people are going to be scientists and academics who are going to go out and fund and start a company. When you're in academics, the, there's the, the grants office and they take care of it for you. When you're doing this, you, you, you have to be really on top of the accounting. And I think it's, uh, from my perspective, it's best uh, to deal with um, an accounting agency firm or individual who has great experience dealing with grants, who understands it. And then you still have to stay on top of it as uh, the PI or the person involved. But I'm, I'm not, it sounds like Erica's a complete package and she can do this, but I'm, I'm just not capable of managing them myself. And so uh, in order for it to be done properly, um, I, I need to work with someone um, or a firm that has that. And uh, I think if you've got to start it right and it needs to be done very carefully. Rebecca, you raise your hand. <laughs> yes, I, I must clarify one thing. <laughs> when I refer to control uh, and, and manage, I meant uh, to literally, uh, you know, request the funds to the payment management system that comes into the bank account and then send the report out. But all the internal accounting, yes, thumbs up. I agree with Evan. I'm sorry, I miss, uh, I confused your name, Evan, with Dave <laughs> before. But I agree with Evan. Yes, you must um, contract uh, an accounting firm to uh, do, you know, the minor um, daily uh, expenditures okay. and balances mm -hmm. and so on. And sometimes, um, you know, from my perspective, if the accounting uh, firm is, is good, it will take, you know, about $900 per month uh, or so to do the work. And they have in place different uh, applications um, that will help uh, with the accounting and will allow you to go in online, you know, and see what is the status of the balance. If you have uh, the success, of having uh, multiple SBIRs that belongs to different projects. The accounting uh, systems can be established in a way where you create departments and uh, every time you justify the payment of a bill, right? You select the department and it goes automatically. 
to the right bucket. So definitely, I recommend an accounting firm to support you uh, throughout all these uh, the, the daily activities. What I meant is the control, you know, with the money coming in and going out and having this balance of a burning rate and, and, and so on. Sorry. I just, oh. I, I totally agree with Evan. <laughs> Great. And, and Sonia put a great uh, comment in, in, uh, in the chat as well, um, that if you don't manage your allowables correctly, it is considered fraud um, with the federal government. So, um, yeah. so yes, it's uh, great yeah. to hear that everybody thinks uh, it's yeah. important to get a good. It, it helps to make everything really transparent because you, you access your accounting system and you can show, you know, you receive an audit and you can show, you know, in a, in a glance how things are coming so yeah totally. uh, just uh, uh a comment if you're above uh, 750,000 drawdown to one company on aggregate grants my understanding is that you need an audit and so uh what eric is saying you've got a professional firm and the audit can be pretty straightforward but you know Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, generally, when you're going to get a phase two for most uh, uh, agencies, they will perform an accounting audit before they give you the money. So I recommend from the get go that you set up the right accounting in place with a professional accountant that knows how to do government contracts and government grants that sets you up correctly and monitors you and you have your accurate timekeeping. That's one of the key things that a lot of people lag and that uh, you're constantly auditing yourself, even from the get-go, from the phase one, implement your processes uh, for accounting and, and uh, quality systems, anything you can have in place. As you grow, it's gonna be helpful, but under a phase two, if, before they give you the money, they generally will perform an audit. And in the case of the DOD with DCMA, they can come in uh, any day unannounced. I mean, you have to have those books in place. They have to be good. And it's serious manner. You have to take this seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wanted to make uh, one comment. Um, our accountant has recommended that we pay the employees hourly. Uh, effectively, they're working full time, but then um, they have to record their hours because you're working on one project it's very tough to get employees to accurately record their hours, but if they're being paid hourly, then it's easier to do that. Although the employees don't seem like uh, to like being play, paid hourly. So this is one of the struggles that we're dealing with currently in, in both of the companies I'm working with is making this transition to paying people hourly, yet they're effectively full-time and absolutely accurately recording the hours on each project on you know a weekly basis okay. great um does anybody have any closing thoughts for the group as we're coming up to the hour to the end of the session i have or one more. one one thought um is in terms of uh what it takes to get uh, one of these grants uh, the first uh, time I submitted my SBIR, it was a, a, a huge effort and it, it wasn't funded at all. <laughs> uh, so I, I literally cried. <laughs> but uh, then I learned that uh, this, this is a, a learning process as everything in life and uh, we go back and perfect the strategy and you know launch again uh, for the next fly and uh, try so uh, it may take uh, one year two years of refinements um, to get one so uh, don't get disappointed if you are not getting the, the what you were expecting it um, because because uh, there is a growth um, ahead if you persist right and and keep in mind the reviewers feedback um for that perfection uh you know you will succeed at at some point so just just keep that in mind great um 
so we're coming up to the hour and I just want to uh, thank everybody, thank the panel, thank um, everybody for uh, in the audience for joining us and asking such great questions. Um, and to um, send you the link for next month's uh, AZ Bio Peers event, which is Tales from the Road from with Tassos Yanakakos, um, who uh, sold myocardia to Bristol Myers Squibb for 13 billion. So um, he's got a lot of information to share um, to aspiring on to uh, to entrepreneurs. So thank you so much for joining us. And